Okay, great. And then what we'll do, we will share the screen. Put that on there. Share. And then. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. And then we might need to. Do you want this? Is yeah, that good or even completely? Get it? I think that's okay. Okay. I just move around a little bit. okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you everybody for coming. So for those of you <clears throat> virtual and online, thank you very much for, um, for coming uh, and for everybody who's here as well. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Suzanne Tang. So just a bit of information uh, with regard to Suzanne's background. So Suzanne received her PhD from Simon Fraser University in 2009, uh, after which she received an NSERC PDF and worked at Woods Hole, Massachusetts for a couple of years, from 2009 to 2011. Uh, uh, Suzanne joined York University uh, for three years, I believe, until 2014. Uh, and then we were very fortunate to have her join Biological Sciences as a prestigious CAPE chair recipient and Cape Chair in Aquatic Ecosystem Health, and that was in 2014. So Suzanne's research is broadly focused on understanding the current and future functioning of aquatic ecosystems. The work in her lab has a particular focus on connections between ecology, biogeochemistry, and processes occurring across the land, freshwater, ocean continuum. In essence, she thinks deeply about climate change, permafrost, carbon cycling, and nutrient dynamics, and how these processes act and interact in freshwater systems from the Canadian Arctic to the Pacific coast. And I'm very excited to, to see what, you, what you're going to be talking about today. So I think everything is set up. So okay, great. Suzanne, please uh, take Thanks. it away. Thanks for that nice introduction. There's your pointer. Yeah. And I should also introduce, uh, move the slides forward as well. Oh, it does. Okay, let's see. Yes, okay, great. Um, so I, I like to start my talks with my um, acknowledgements just to make sure I don't forget them. So I'll start here just uh, first acknowledging, of course, that the, um, the work that I'm gonna be talking about today, of course, was done mostly by grad students. Um, and I've been really lucky to have a really fabulous group over the past uh, seven or eight years that I've been here at the U of A. So um, a series of grad students, a lot of names you'll see popping up as I go through the talk. Um, really some important and other kind of um, PI level collaborators at the U of A as well. Um, outside collaborators in particular, Steve Kokel, who works for the government of the Northwest Territories, has been really integral to the work that I'm going to be talking about um, in today's presentation. Um, and then I'd like to kick this talk off also by acknowledging that most of the work that I'm going to be showing you today um, was carried out in the Gwich'in Settlement region in the Northwest Territories. And so we work really closely with the Tetlik Gwich'in Renewable Resources Council. So this is based in Fort McPherson. And we've been really lucky to have a number of individuals um, help us with this work. So when Declan asked me to give this talk, I guess it was about five weeks ago now, something like that. Um, and then when I started to think about putting it together a little bit closer to today, a week ago or so, um, I, I guess what I what I started to reflect on was, you know, so I suppose what we're supposed to be doing with these presentations is kind of not introducing ourselves, but kind of presenting ourselves to our colleagues, right? And so I started to think a little bit about myself, myself as a researcher, and I suppose the kind of tenants, if you will, that under pin kind of the work I'll show you today, but just kind of my research program also more broadly. Um, whoop, that wasn't supposed to skip like that. Um, so, you know, I guess first I, I come to science trained as a, definitely as an aquatic ecologist, but a lot of what I'll show you today is very biogeochemical in nature. So biogeochemistry, thinking about elements, how they move through environments and cycle through organisms and kind of environmental cycles. Um, and so I put this quote up here, just kind of thinking about biogeochemistry. It comes from this early and really seminal book by Vladimir Verdansky, who wrote, as you can see, in 1926, the book, The Biosphere. It was published in Russian, um, not um, actually translated to English until 
1998 or something like that. But this is kind of the, uh, this would be, this guy would be kind of considered the father of modern biogeochemistry, um, if you will. And so paraphrasing from his book, this idea that life on earth is so pervasive that there's no science of geochemistry on the earth's surface. So if we don't, you know, fundamentally think about biology and ecological processes, even when we're thinking about big things like the carbon cycle and things that we might on their face consider to be kind of geochemical cycles, we're really lost. And so this is something that came to me during my PhD. Um, I'm somebody who had done a master's before their PhD. And so I went into Lance Lee Sachs lab to do a PhD and I just really wanted to think about food labs. And he was like, no, you got to think about biogeochemistry. I, I don't know, I got kind of, <laughs> what's that, right? And so kind of through that process of thinking through um, food webs in Arctic lakes and how they were affected by different carbon cycles or different carbon sources, which is what I did during my PhD, I really kind of developed this um, appreciation for biogeochemistry. And this is obviously kind of carried through my research program to the point that it's really quite foundational today, but always underpinned by uh, biology first, it has to be. Um, but then, you know, before I did my, um, my PhD, I did a master's actually here. I was really lucky to do a master's here in Dave Schindler's lab and get really good training as a, a limnologist in a really vibrant research group. So I'd say also when I think about kind of, and this is gonna come across in my talk, I think, when I think about how ecosystems function, I always still very much take a limnologist perspective and the kind of, classic way of understanding limnology, I don't know if Bill will agree with me or not, is to um, first think about the physical, then think about how the physical structure is the chemical, and then think about how the biological is the really nice umbrella that rests upon that. So in a lake, you know, we think about temperature profile stratification, and we can't really understand what the nutrients are doing until we understand if our lake is stratified. And then once we understand that, you know, we start to think about um, organisms and their interactions. So this is kind of the early teaching that I got from Dave that I, I, I also still really carry through my research program. Um, and then um, as a postdoc, I was really fortunate again to um, get a chance to go to Woods Hole and move from thinking about kind of the lake systems, which are these really nice kind of encapsulated ecosystems to thinking about big rivers. So in this case, big Arctic rivers, um, but kind of big, big rivers and big river processes. And so the thing I really started to think about as a postdoc was kind of the connectivity that fluvial systems um, really present. And the fact that, you know, when we think about fluvial systems, large or small, we're really thinking about a system that integrates. So um, this is a, an image that I use in my uh, freshwater ecology class, but I put it up to make the point that, um, uh, fluvial systems, fluvial networks in particular are real integrators. So this is the Mississippi catchment. And, you know, I tell my students that, you know, we could take a sample down here by the Gulf of Mexico and we can't really understand this dead zone down here without understanding what's happening in the agriculturally rich regions of the Corn Belt, right? And if we think about how um, the chemistry down here has changed over time, that also tells us a lot about what's happening over up here. So, you know, this kind of interconnectivity. So I'd say from each of my three kind of pieces of academic training, I have these three components that really underpin me as a scientist. Um, and so with that, I'll take you, that maybe took a bit longer than I wanted. I'll take you to the Western Canadian Arctic and kind of the meat of my talk. Um, I'm gonna have to move the people to leave. Um, so, I'm going to talk about kind of um, some work that I've done that started actually at York just before I came here to the U of A, but that has been um, uh, a fairly central, I guess, component of my research program and certainly kind of carries through to the present day. So um, the Peel Plateau in the Western Canadian Arctic lies um, kind of just west of the Mackenzie Delta, so right at the Northwest Territories Yukon border. And for, region, for reasons I'll explain as these slides go on, it's a region that is really quite catastrophically affected by permafrost thaw. 
So you can see here a stream that's affected by a series of what we would call thaw slumps. And these, these are really just kind of collapse scars that are occurring on this landscape as what is um, uh, ice rich landscape, I'll explain that in a second, um, is thawing relatively quickly with, um, with climate warming. Um, so one thing that's interesting or notable, I suppose, that will become important as we go through this talk about the Pill Plateau. So this is, it's too bad, I guess the people online can't see my pointer, hey. This is the Peel Plateau, maybe if I, this is the Peel Plateau kind of here. So you can see Northwest Territories Yukon border, and this is the Mackenzie Delta. Um, so kind of focusing on this left panel here, one thing that's notable at the Peel Plateau is that it lies right at the extent of glaciation from the last glacial, glacial maximum. So what happened in this region is that glaciers advanced, sat on the plateau for a few thousand years. Um, and then retreated left be as a result of this, left behind kind of these really thick deposits of glacial till. Um, but as a result of um, kind of pro-glacial processes, which as I understand it are still kind of hotly debated in the geosciences community, they also deposited kind of these um, vast deposits of what you would call massive ground ice that are now sequestered, frozen in permafrost, right? So when the ground thaws in this region, we have thawing of not just frozen soil, but also thawing of these chunks of massive ground ice. So as a result, when this thawing happens, you get instead of this kind of um, movement down a soil profile of a thaw front, you get these, I'm just gonna flip back, oops, you get these massive kind of collapse features caused by this ice rich landscape. So this, uh, this is a nice older paper by Denis LaSalle that kind of sets this up. You can see the extent of the glacial maximum here and then newer work by Steve Kokel. Um, and you can see throughout the Western Canadian Arctic, um, here's the extent of glacial, uh, the, um, the Laurentide ice sheet kind of through here. So you can see this, these kinds of hot spots of thermokarst, uh, what we call thermokarst throughout this landscape. Um, and so what this means is that um, obviously we're seeing really um, rapid change throughout this landscape. So this is kind of one of the larger thaw slumps in the Peel Plateau region. And of course, features that are really, um, that are progressing over time and really kind of um, I don't know, notably strikingly impacting fluvial networks, impacting stream systems. So this is a stream network flowing through here that's impacted by two thaw slumps and you can see um, the growth of these through time. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, I guess just to kind of uh, continue this setup. So um, the work that I've shown on the last few slides is work that's been done, really nice work that's been done um, by um, collaborators, some of which I've been lucky to be involved in. Um, Jaden Smith in my lab, I just thought I'd put this up because she's just about to defend her master's in January, has done some really nice work um, in the Willow River catchment up by Aklavik. Um, thinking very specifically about how this growth of slumping has changed on the landscape. And so you can see she's done some uh, remote sensing based work to track over time. So this is the estimated um, uh, extent of the Laurentide ice sheet in the Willow River catchment, which is over here. And you can see the progression. And so each pixel shows a, um, a pixel where a thaw slump Thing is occurring and the density of slumping that occurs. So you can see this progression over time. Um, shown a bit more simply. Uh, sorry. Uh, shown a bit more simply um, over here on this panel, you can see kind of the aerial extent that's affected by um, thaw slumping and different kind of feature types. Um, and I won't go into it. Yeah. Um, I, I won't go into any more of Jaden's project um, here, but she's uh, doing some really nice work um, 
looking at, so the Willow River um, drains into the Mackenzie Delta, so this real kind of depositional environment, and she's doing some really nice work pouring a lake, which we call Willow Lake, that's basically filled up with sediment. This is how kind of catastrophic this slumping is, and pouring kind of through um, a series of sediments to think about um, how the composition of materials flowing downstream has changed as a result of this disturbance. So this is kind of the Peel Plateau and what it looks like and how it's been changing over the past few decades or so. Um, back when I started thinking about this, which was, you know, coming on a decade or so ago now, um, I really started to kind of think about the effects of permafrost thaw in this region in the context of what is kind of colloquially, colloquially called the permafrost carbon feedback. Um, so this figure here is um, a figure that was put together by Gustav Hugelius um, some time ago now, and basically just um, shows the estimated content of or organic carbon in soils within the permafrost region. So this is a circumpolar projection map. And I'm sure most people will be familiar, right, within kind of the uh, popular literature, this idea that uh, we, we obviously have all this organic carbon that's locked up in permafrost, what is basically frozen soils. And so as permafrost thaws, we should expect what some researchers have even like gone as far to, as to call a carbon bomb, right? We should expect the decomposition of this organic matter, a feedback to warming within the carbon cycle. Um, and so kind of this positive permafrost carbon feedback. Um, again, around the time that I started to think about the Peel Plateau as a neat way to think about changes in the carbon cycle, um, there was some really interesting and foundational work um, coming out of um, regions where permafrost is, is composed of what we would call yetama. So up in here in yellow and red, these are Yetama regions throughout the circumpolar Arctic. So these are basically regions that weren't glaciated during the last glacial maximum. They accumulated um, a ton of soil as a result of dust deposition because they weren't glaciated. Um, and kind of alongside that accumulation um, kind of house sort of uh, grassland ecosystems. Um, and so back about a decade or, ago now, or so ago now, there was this really foundational work. So here I'm showing um, uh, a figure from a paper by Stephanie Ewing um, throughout a permafrost core showing dissolved organic carbon concentrations um, down core and um, how they kind of, both how they increase down core, but also for those of you who know anything about dissolved organic carbon, um, a thing to know about this figure is that these concentrations are incredibly and strikingly high. So when we think in, in aquatic, um, in the aquatic sciences, when we think about kind of microbial degradation of organic carbon, we typically think about processes that are happening in the dissolved phase because it's the dissolved phase of organic carbon that's easily accessible by microbes. Um, and so um, these kind of concentrations of dissolved organic carbon in permafrost compared to what we would normally see in aquatic systems in around, I think the global average is four milligrams per liter. Um, certainly anything above 10 is, is really quite high. Um, so these kind of really strikingly high concentrations of organic carbon that seem like they're being um, liberated as a result of permafrost thaw. Um, down here, I'm showing some work by Paul Mann, which was uh, done on stream systems in Siberia. Again, you can see these really high concentrations of organic carbon that were um, liberated to thaw streams as a result of permafrost thaw compared to um, nearby concentrations in unimpacted systems. And so this is a degradation experiment um, uh, showing kind of over um, a period of days, really also really fast degradation. So as a result, people in the aquatic sciences of work like this, really foundational, people in the aquatic sciences community um, really started to think pretty foundationally about, um, yeah, this kind of positive feedback to climate change that might be going on. Um, however, when we move to the Peel Plateau, we 
obviously are dealing with a system that looks quite a bit different than these Yetima systems, which is because this work was so foundational, what our, um, I guess what our thinking about um, the effects of permafrost law, certainly from an aquatic um, sciences perspective, um, came to really be built upon. So of course, at depth on the Peel Plateau, we think about these Pleistocene origin glacial tills, right, that were deposited by the um, activity of the Laurentide ice sheet. Um, and so these are mineral deposits that have never, that were immediately frozen in permafrost. So they're kind of locked in time. Um, towards the surface here, we have the active layer. So this is the region of the soil that is um, thawing and refreezing um, seasonally, just you know, as you would expect around here. And then we also have, this is maybe just a point of interest, but because of um, warmer um, conditions 12 to 8,000 years ago during the early Holocene warm interval, there's actually a relict active layer here when um, active layers were deeper, um, soil um, development kind of started to occur. And then when cooler conditions returned, we got the re-aggradation of permafrost. Um, and so this relict active layer was locked in permafrost. So, you know, if we think of all this from a carbon cycle perspective, we need to think about, of course, not just the dissolved organic stuff, which we know is important and is really active and is um, actively cycling, but we also need to think about mineral processes. So what's going on with this kind of locked up stuff. And then in a region where thaw is so incredibly um, catastrophic, um, as well as thinking about what's happening in the dissolved phase, we also need to think about processes happening in the particulate phase as well. So I don't know how well the light is maybe not great, but this is just kind of um, water that's mixing as two uh, water sources are coming together. So yeah, I won't spend too much time here, but just, you know, this idea, um, this is actually an image from my last NSERC proposal, but an idea that we really need to take a slightly more holistic view of the freshwater carbon cycle, right? So move beyond, this keeps falling down the sand, uh, move beyond just thinking about what's happening here in the dissolved organic phase to also think about kind of um, these weathering associated processes and what's going on over here with the particles and how these things all inter, how these things all interact with each other. Um, and so, I, I mean, maybe this kind of just belabors the point, but because um, I kind of said this a few slides ago, but, um, you know, this certainly wasn't, well, it continues to really not be where the community is, and it's too bad, but certainly, you know, when I started thinking about this um, back around when I came here to the U of A, there was a fair bit of research, so this is just a, a web of science output, um, there was a fair bit of research thinking about these things related to dissolved organics. But if we then start to think about um, uh, kind of where the community is at with weathering um, and thinking about kind of how that incorporates into the carbon cycle, you know, a little bit less attention being paid to that. And certainly um, uh, thinking about kind of the, the particulate phase and how that plays into these processes. This is something that I would say has uh, really to our detriment as a community, but been um, by and large ignored. Okay, so to think about these things, uh, we've been working on the Peel Plateau, right? Um, and I'll show you um, kind of a series of, um, I guess, kind of components of work being done by various grad students that we've done mostly in the, um, so let's see, this is Fort McPherson um, here, the Mackenzie Delta is here, mostly in the uh, Stony Creek and Vitrico River catchments. So I'll show you work that we've done on a series of slump sites, some of which we can access from the road, but not all. Um, and also um, work that we've done along stream transects, mostly in Stony Creek. Um, and so these sites, when we initially picked them uh, back in 2014, uh, we're chosen to kind of range conditions across the catchment that I won't get into too much, but also to um, kind of range the uh, morphology that you might expect for slumps. So from very kind of small systems that are really only touching that Holocene relict active layer 
through to these really large mega slumps that are definitely kind of um, digging into and unearthing these deeper glacial tills. And you can see this relative active layer really nicely in this image here. Okay, so I mean, the first thing that you notice, and I've, had, I've showed images um, to illustrate this already, the first thing that you notice when you go to this region is, is that it's changing, and it's changing really quickly, and that it's incredibly disturbed. Um, so this figure here um, takes data from a few um, uh, students that I've been lucky to have in my lab, and just looks at the, so across all of these things, the inorganic and the organic, the dissolved and the particulate, sum them all together, to look at what carbon concentrations look like. So for a series of three of these slump sites, upstream of slumps, so in regions that are impacted by thawing, in these kind of real waters or drainage channels that are draining from slumps, so that's within slumps, and then in the downstream system. So here's a stream flowing through a disturbed valley. Uh, you can see that I'm showing these data on the log scale here, right? And so, I mean, the simple take home message is that we're seeing orders multiple orders of magnitude increases in kind of carbon that's flowing through these systems. When we look at what's just happening in the, so the earliest work that we did um, kind of really piggybacked on what had been done in those other Yetima regions and looked at what was happening um, in the dissolved organic phase. And so when we look at um, this um, dissolved organic carbon. So here again, comparing upstream sites to what's draining from slumps. This is that really small um, shallow slump that I showed an image of a few slides ago. Um, so when we look at what it looks like, and we can look at this a few ways, but if we just look at the age of the carbon, we can see the stuff in impacted sites is nice and modern, right? And then if we get, especially to these larger slump features, we're dealing with clearly carbon that's being unearthed by thaw. When we do really simple, and there's lots of ways to criticize these, but when we do really simple incubations um, that have microbes included in them as inocula to look at um, degradation of carbon over time, so under dark conditions, so no photosynthesis, and under oxic conditions, when we compare upstream to within slump sites, we can see that this carbon is also, just like from that pulp, that band paper, um, decomposing much more quickly, degrading much more quickly. Again, this is that site that was really shallow, so it kind of stands out as being a little bit different. Um, so from the dissolved organic perspective, everything's kind of looking as we would expect, but if we take this figure and expand it a little bit to think about, you know, if we're looking at this, this kind of fundamental change in amount of carbon moving through these systems, if we look at how that's changing compositionally, so this is kind of the proportion of 100% percentage, I suppose, of this pool. Uh, we can see that, you know, when we're upstream, we're thinking of where these dissolved organic processes fundamentally must be really important, right? Because of this total carbon pool, the dissolved organics are kind of really where it's at. But as soon as we get this kind of unearthing caused by thaw, we're moving to really having to think about things that are happening in the inorganic phase. So these are particulate inorganics. And, you know, kind of as a large whole, also what's happening with the particulates. Um, when we kind of incorporate this to think, uh, to kind of circle back, I suppose, and think about the dissolved organics. Again, you know, when we look at the data a little bit um, more closely, so this is, um, uh, data from Kara Littlefair's thesis. She was Kara Bulger when she was here. We can see that when we compare dissolved organic carbon concentrations between upstream and downstream sites at the same slump, if we look at that ratio, we can see that by and large, we see declines. But kind of looking at this data closely, it doesn't seem like this is a dilution effect of what's coming out of the slumps, because depending on where the slumps are in this catchment, and I won't talk too much about like the vegetation and what it's doing. Um, sometimes we have kind of higher concentrations draining from the slumps, sometimes we have lower. We definitely never have those off the chart concentrations that we've seen in other regions. And so we kind of hypothesize at that time, and this is something I'm just starting to think about a little bit more now, 
that probably what was happening was there was kind of some kind of interaction between inorganic sediments and these dissolved organics and some kind of, um, sometimes these can, these can be microbially mediated, but absorption that is almost kind of protecting this carbon and taking it out of the dissolved pool. So if we think, so that's kind of this component of our kind of holistic view of the, I keep losing my pointer, um, the holistic view of the carbon cycle, right? And so uh, in the dissolved organic phase, it's kind of behaving as we would expect well, for the most part, but um, you know, just if you crunch the math, it's probably not a big player in what's going on. Um, and so I'll move next to think a little bit about work that we've done over here, uh, or up here, I guess, to think more about chemical weathering processes. Um, and so I thought I would introduce chemical weathering um, this way. Um, and kind of, well, so this is one of my, if, you know, if I was to give you my list of top 10 favorite papers, this would be on, on the list. So introduce chemical weathering as a kind of quote unquote in brackets, mostly biologically driven process. So this is kind of this classic paper by Rob Benner who's at Yale University from a, a couple decades now ago now um, that thought about kind of the carbon cycle over, you know, very long multi, um, multi hundred millions of years timescales. Um, and was it has kind of throughout his career done this really nice work showing kind of how the rise of land plants and the interaction between um, the rise of land plants and the Devonian and how this how kind of deepening uh, roots through soil profiles really was able to kind of enhance chemical weathering and as well as through photosynthesis draw down carbon dioxide fixation. Um, so when we think about chemical weathering, we think about really two different processes. Mostly we think about this process here, whereby carbon dioxide dissolves in water to create carbonic acid. This carbon dioxide, as I explained not super well up here, is not mostly from the atmosphere. It's actually mostly from organic matter decomposition in soils and root respiration, right? Which is why plants really drive weathering in soils. But when you take this carbonic acid and combine it with rock, um, the chemical weathering reaction that results fixes what is basically dissolved carbon dioxide as bicarbonate. This is no longer um, in the gaseous phase, so it can no longer interact with the atmosphere. This bicarbonate flows through river networks to the ocean through processes it's buried. And so this is kind of the inorganic um, carbon cycle over kind of very large time spans. So there's this kind of carbonic acid driven um, chemical weathering, and this fixes carbon dioxide. On the other hand, and this doesn't, isn't as well thought, isn't as, it doesn't come up as much in the literature. It's, uh, you, you see this popping up uh, much more, but more, more and more prominently, we're seeing folks pay attention to weathering that is uh, mediated by other acids. So here I'm showing weathering that's mediated by sulfuric acid, which, unless you're dealing with kind of a contaminated system is typically generated in freshwater systems through the oxidative weathering of pyrite or sulfide minerals, which again is a microbially catalyzed uh, reaction um, uh, that occurs in various ways, but by chemosynthetic microbes. So this reaction here, this is the weathering reaction down here is, has the exact same opposite effect as this one up here. So here, we have fixation of carbon dioxide. Here we have sulfuric acid as our acid, but it's acting on rock like calcium carbonate slash limestone rocks that have carbon contained in them and effectively liberating the carbon that's contained in the rock, um, um, enabling its transformation to bicarbonate and eventually, I didn't put the second reaction here, but eventually to carbon dioxide that is available for efflux to the overlying atmosphere. So all this to say, uh, when people talk about weathering, they're really talking about a biological process, but how weathering plays out is important. Um, the carbonic acid kind fixes carbon dioxide, the sulfuric acid and other acids kind uh, tends to um, release um, carbon dioxide to the overlying atmosphere. 
So um, Scott Zolkos, who defended his PhD a, a little while ago now, um, he's moved on to a really nice postdoc just before the, he defended just before the pandemic, did, had a really nice thesis on thinking about these processes on the Peel Plateau. Um, his work showed that, again, when we compare upstream this time to within slump systems and look at carbon dioxide concentrations, Again, we're on a log scale. This is kind of what we would expect from the atmosphere here. We get this kind of close to orders of magnitude increase in carbon dioxide um, that's available to efflux to the overlying atmosphere. When we use carbon isotopes to think about where that's coming from, so if this, if this carbon dioxide was coming from organic matter decomposition, we would expect it to look like terrestrial organic matter, which isotopically looks like this. Um, instead, this carbon dioxide has, um, has a signature that looks a lot, well, it, it, that looks like it's coming from rock. Um, and when we look at, oh, wow, oh my God, I don't know what happened. Sorry. Uh, when we look at um, also sulfur isotopes and oxygen isotopes, um, and compare um, from a sulfur perspective, uh, where the sulfate that kind of pairs with this might be coming from because so most sulfur and freshwater systems, well, sulfur and freshwater systems is either coming originally from gypsum or from these sulfide um, minerals that I've just talked about. This kind of change, this um, efflux of production of CO2 that we're seeing here that looks like it's from weathering is almost certainly coming from the kind of oxidative weathering of pyrite and this generation of sulfuric acid that comes in association with sulfide minerals. So this kind of overall release of CO2 to the atmosphere as a result of geogenic uh, processes. Um, when we look at kind of what's sitting on the landscape, so oops, this is a thaw slump up here. Um, this region up here, we would call the scar zone, but then because we're having so much um, material unearthed, a lot of it doesn't stay in suspension in the stream, it just ends up being deposited in what we would call a debris tongue. So when we look at kind of this repository on the landscape, um, Scott did some really nice incubations to show that this debris tongue material, even though it's been sitting there uh, for several decades in some cases now, continues to be really quite reactive um, compared to this to this kind of deep sequestered Pleistocene material or this stuff um, from um, material from active soil. So kind of this kind of active weathering that's clearly happening. But, um, and I'll draw your attention to the right hand side here. Um, when we look at kind of how this uh, carbon dioxide efflux is able to persist as we move through stream networks, so here again, um, from a series of slumps, this isn't a great figure, but it just shows um, from a model Scott did his measured uh, carbon dioxide concentrations and what he modeled by a variety of factors. But I put this figure up just to make the point that it's the, what he's labeled runoff here, but kind of that those channels that are just draining the slumps where we get these really high carbon dioxide concentrations. By the time we get to immediately downstream of our permafrost thaw features, the carbon dioxide looks almost exactly the same as in upstream systems. Despite the fact that, so this shows bicarbonate as you move through the stream network, despite the fact that bicarbonate is persisting as and accumulating as we move through with increasing thaw. Okay, so, that's kind of the dissolved organic carbon stuff. Behaves like we would expect, but numerically probably not that important. Um, the weathering side of things, surprisingly, we well, we were, we were, it was kind of a point of interest at the time. Instead of uh, fixing CO2, these weathering processes are kind of causing carbon dioxide to efflux to the overlying atmosphere. And so then the question remains, and this was the paper that I highlighted in my um, the spiel I had to give, what's going on with the particles, right? And obviously this is where we need to focus our attention. Um, so this is really nice work that um, Sarah Shaquille, who defended her thesis back in Jan uh, January, February, um, has, has, has done. And that's been 
really, really well received. Um, so, I mean, this figure here kind of just reiterates the figure on the last slide, but, you know, across a series of slumps, if we compare upstream concentrations of up to downstream concentrations of what's going on in the particulate organic phase, again, we're dealing with orders of magnitude increase, like this is really where the action's at. Um, when Sara compared upstream systems to downstream systems, um, again, sometimes, you know, thesis uh, figures don't translate themselves so well to, um, to what you might want to show in a talk. But um, so here um, you can see a series of PCAs, but basically just showing um, compositional parameters for particulate organics, upstream of slumps, draining slumps, and downstream of slumps. Um, I won't go into each of the kind of individual parameters too much, but suffice it to say that when we look at upstream impacted sites, the organic matter looks terrestrial, it always looks terrestrial, but looks terrestrial, but really indicate with markers that are indicating it's relatively fresh. So uh, uh, recent organic matter production hasn't undergone a lot of reworking. The stuff coming out of slumps um, in contrast is, is much more degraded. So kind of um, should probably behave a little bit differently. Sarah also did some um, incubation type work to think about um, what was likely to be happening with this par um, particulate matter that was leaving um, slump systems. So, and she did a really nice job of doing, uh, doing these incubations from kind of a really holistic perspective. So here I'm showing a percent change across a series of incubation. She looked at different particle sizes because we know things like clays can affect this, but she's showing kind of the percent change in coupled incubations for dissolved organics, which are decreasing. So being decomposed, um, to the total organic carbon pool and the particulate organics. So the percent change, because the, this concentration starts out being much lower than this one, is a little bit deceiving, um, but the dissolved organics behaving like we would expect, but you see this increase in the particulate organic pool. So, you know, one thing that could be going on is flocculation or absorption to the particles that were already in the experiment. So we know dissolved stuff can become particulate. But when we look at changes in total organic carbon relative to changes in oxygen, so this is the line that you expect for heterotrophic respiration, it's clear that we have organic matter um, generation that's occurring within these, um, these really nice experiments that Sara did. Um, when she looked, when she coupled this work, looking at changes in, so here I just look at the, um, and this is a bit more of a complicated figure, but if you just look at the last uh, bars here, when she coupled this with changes in what's happening within the nitrogen cycle and within the sulfur cycle, we see this kind of movement through the nitrogen cycle from ammonia to nitrite nitrate. Um, and in particular, this really large, if you look at the, um, the axes generation of sulfate, that is consistent with, so these are just kind of um, uh, kind of bulk incubations, but that's really consistent with chemoautotrophy, which of course kind of came up in the weathering work. So nitrification, but I think in this case, in particular, sulfur oxidation um, as being really important organic matter generators in the system. So ecologically, totally different than where we started out, right? Where the carbon community was saying that we have all this carbon, it must be being degraded. It looks like something very different is potentially going on. And then just um, kind of thinking about, again, the ultimate fate of this carbon. So this is a figure um, that I showed a few slides ago, but kind of just thinking about what happens as this stuff is being deposited in these debris tons. So um, this figure on the left, maybe not strictly necessary, but just some really nice work again by collaborator Steve Coquel that kind of basically just shows that as your slump area increases, the volume of your debris tongue increases too, not surprisingly. Um, but Sara did some really nice, and I don't have a figure to go along with it, but really nice back of the envelope calculations to show that, you know, thinking back to these um, really striking increases in particulate organics that are flowing through the system and maybe kind of 
depending on where they land, fundamentally changing function. Um, she did some really nice back of envelope calculations to show that what we're building here is really a repository that is likely to last for hundreds, if not thousands of years on this landscape. Um, and then kind of continuing to think about this repository, this is my last data slide, this repository and how it's moving downstream. Again, this is another really nice transect study that Sarah did. So moving through this Stony Creek system, looking at particulate organic carbon. Um, so here I'm showing flux, the total amount of particulate organics moving through the system and then kind of compositionally what it, um, oh, I lie, I have one more data slide. Compositionally what it looks like as it moves through this system. So both from um, using kind of different markers of carbon, we can see this kind of really strong increase in flux that persists right to our watershed outlet and really continues to look like the permafrost stuff. So really no evidence of degradation. Okay, and then, so the last thing I wanted to show, and I'm looking at my watch here, um, is work that um, is being done by Marina uh, Taskovich, who is a PhD student who's um, co-supervised by Brian Lenoil. So she's done really similar work in this system, but has really kind of moved beyond um, this more biogeochemical to think, to build on that and think very much about the ecological. So again, from a series, uh, so one of the things that um, Marina's really thinking, well, she's thinking a lot about microbial community structure, but she's also been thinking this past summer about um, uh, biomass production within microbial communities. So that's just quickly what I'm showing here. So again, across this kind of um, series of transect sites, we can see what happens to dissolved organic carbon concentration as we move from an unpacked, unimpacted system through, um, through this watershed to and, and from kind of a tundra landscape also to a much more kind of developed and forested landscape here. Uh, you see this kind of clear and striking increase in sediments as soon as we start to get into impacted components of the watershed. But when we look at bacterial biomass production, so this uh, via tritiated leucine, we can see, and so this is just from this past summer, Marina's just starting to work this up. We can see that these trends that we see are mimicking the dissolved organics rather than the sediments. Again, really pointing to, um, I guess really corroborate, co corroborating Sarah's work and the fact that, um, you know, the, the particles are, um, kind of largely moving down, maybe having these interesting chemosynthetic effects, but largely moving downstream. Okay, so thinking about where to go from here, uh, I'm looking at, I probably need to kind of, yeah, okay. <laughs> thinking about where to go from here, I just, I didn't wanna just leave it there. So yeah, just thinking about where my research program is going. So starting to think really about, um, kind of how these uh, processes at the small scale, because these catchments I've showed you are just really quite small catchments, kind of propagate downstream and make their way through fluvial networks. So, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about working on kind of stream and river systems is that you deal with seasonality, but everything's moving at the same time, right? So processing is happening as you move downstream. And so that makes everything complicated. Um, some work that I've been involved in in big river systems that I haven't really talked about in this talk um, that's been ongoing now for 20 years. We've started to kind of think about trends in kind of various chemical species across big Arctic rivers as a whole. And so interestingly, um, we see kind of increases in weathering constituents. So alkalinity, this is basically inorganic carbon. No change in DOC, probably just because it's it's getting mineralized pretty quickly, but these striking declines in nitrate. So, you know, I've only really talked about carbon cycle work here, but how do things like nitrate propagate as they move downstream? What does this mean for downstream function, even functioning in the near shore Arctic Ocean? And then kind of, as I alluded to in my last data slide, the work that we're moving to is kind of more putting the bio in the biogeochemistry that we tend to do. So, you know, Marina's starting to do some really nice work on carbon transfer through food webs, but also a real interest. So this is maybe a little nitty gritty, but thinking about these chemosynthetic processes and coupled carbon sulfur and carbon nitrogen cycle 
Um, I have a student who's starting to do really interesting stuff on carbon protection um, through these kind of um, sorption processes um, and how that affects um, how accessible what's left over in the water column might be for microbes. And then kind of thinking about this all at the landscape scale. So going back to that original, that early slide where I thought about, you know, Yedema and the Peel Plateau is so different. Well, there's actually landscape characteristics that I think are probably fundamental to help us thinking about this at kind of pan-Arctic scales, right? What are the, what are the big drivers? Okay, I'm a, I went a bit long, I think, I'm sorry. But thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Steph. Um, that was great. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to come off of here so sure. we can see who's um, okay. I hope they could hear me online. I was going to stop sharing. Maybe the flat platform for our mouse. I know. I'm going to get this. <laughs> okay, great. Everything is still recording, uh, and I'm going to put up the um, where's the chat? I think it's just. It's in the more section right now. <clears throat> Great. So if anybody has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Or put up your hand. Or put up your yeah. hand. Yay, Heather. Oh, here we go. So we have one question there from Heather. Yes. Or more than one. Okay. Um, I that great talk, scary slumps. Yeah, they are. Photos. Yeah. I'm wondering how rapidly does vegetation colonize this slump? So quick, so, quick, quick. I mean, I'm not a vegetation person. But that picture that I show that we use from the helicopter to show the upstream, downstream, um, you know, with the, the big debris tongue. So that slump had just happened. So the first time I went to these systems was in 2013, no, summer 2014. And that's, that had just had this like big catastrophic like outflow event. Um, and so it was bare soil and now, and it was pretty easy to hike along. And now the vegetation is up to here. It's, yeah, it's pretty impressive. So I, I assume that there are lots of botanically oriented people up there right now looking for how much carbon is being. Yeah, so that's the thing. Sort of so, right. So yeah, we have these like, well, it's, I find it really cool. Like those paleoactive layers, right? that you know, the active layer had been deeper. So right, you would expect soil development. So there's two things about those debris tongues. First, yeah, absolutely, you'd expect soil development to occur. And some of what is um, kind of flowing into those debris tongues is organic already. Although I think it's the till that flows more easily because it doesn't have the organics, kind of, like you see kind of organic clumps, they don't make it as far down. Um, but also, these debris tongues are, it's crazy. They're like 30 meters deep. So Steve Coquel and some of his group, they do kind of, uh, you can kind of use the landscape shape to kind of know how deep the stream bed had been, right? And so for the really big slumps, the debris tongues are like 30 meters deep. So also you would expect probably some permafrost re-aggradation to happen as well. So some of it is gonna be locked back into permafrost, I think, but yeah, soil development. To, I would expect. And yeah. I would squeeze in one more question as well. So, looking at those debris tongues, how does the water then get through? Does it like go around the tongue? Yeah. Like Channelized down no, the just... around. So, yeah, I don't know how well you can remember that image, but actually, what's happening at that one slump is, and I don't get so excited about this, but collaborators do, is that it's actually causing the stream. So, there's a debris tongue kind of here and then it's in a stream valley and then the streams here and so the streams actually eroding the valley on the other side now mm -hmm. because the debris tongue is forcing it to kind of press against mm -hmm. the valley cool I yeah i'm not asking questions okay. Lisa's Lisa's asking thanks though yes lisa has a question have you no lisa but <laughs> i would love to so um Scott did his work on uh, Vince's greenhouse gas analyzer, which has an ECD on it. So if it was, if we had taken the time, could have measured nitrous oxide, but he measured carbon dioxide and methane. And then the ECD, we just didn't get it set up. So we didn't get the nitrous oxide um, measurements, but it would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next time. 
No, it's great. So can I ask a quick question before Rolf gets yeah. in his? Mm -hmm. um, and you, you may have shown this, I apologize that if I missed it. Are the number and the sizes of the slumps changing over time? So as we see them yeah. compared with... So number, yeah, absolutely. Um, they kind of occur in bands. And so the ice sheet had, it's kind of not my thing, but the ice sheet had like recessional fronts. So whenever it had a standstill, I guess you, that's where you get the ice um, de deposition in the permafrost. And so you can kind of see the bands on the landscape. And so, yeah, lots more occurring over time. And then how big they get kind of depends on, so they'll thaw where there's ice and then they stabilize because they get sediment kind of stabilizing the surface. Mm -hmm. And then you get like a big precipitation event or a warm summer. And they kind of then start to grade backwards, but they kind of have to meet ice to, okay. to grow. So it depends a bit on what the landscape okay. looks like. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ralph, you mentioned your expectation that DOC might be sorbed to get inorganic particles, removing it, greater affinity for removing. A yeah, so yeah, the terrestrial stuff goes first. So that's neat actually, Rolf, because I think, so we have this permafrost carbon and I didn't really talk about it in the talk, but it looks very um, like uh, autochthonous-y, right? Like it looks very fresh. It doesn't look very terrestrial, but if there's all this sorption that's happening in the permafrost, which I think is possible, then maybe it's just that the harder to degrade stuff is on the particles. And then what is left in the pool is the easier to degrade stuff. And maybe this is, well, there's lots of reasons why it would build up over time. So yeah, they're sorting with the sorption. Or I think there should be. Nobody's really looked at this in permafrost regions, but that's kind of what we understand from more Southern studies. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Great. Anything else? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. when, you, when you expand to, to the pan Arctic mm -hmm. and all these large river systems, especially in Russia, yeah. do they have similar characteristics, similar amounts of ice, or I suppose it varies from no. one catchment to the other? There are, so a lot of Russia was um, not glaciated. So you get these kind of um, glacial margin landscapes throughout the Pan-Arctic. Um, I would say Western Canada is one of the hotspots. We do see it in some regions of Russia as well. There, the Yedema that I talked about has a lot of ice in it, but because of what the landscape looks like, that permafrost thaw tends to result in thermocarst lakes instead, which has a totally different effect, right? So I don't know, do you know Katie Walter Anthony's work? She did stuff in the Arctic and like uh, uh, lakes form, and then you get like lots of methane happening and anoxic sediments and stuff. But what you do see in those regions where there's lots of ice in the permafrost is lots of bank erosion on those from the big rivers because they have lots of power to erode the banks. Okay, great. Uh, any further questions? It looks as if I think that's it. So again, thank you very much. Yeah, Suzanne. thanks, Stephanie. I wanted for to asking uh, me. And now I've done my, I know, I'm my so glad. chair seminar. <laughs> I'm so glad that you can do this. I'd like to present you with uh, a biosign awesome. water bomb. Thanks. And all of the all of the um, the lectures, chairs, lectures have been receiving one. And yeah, I'm, thanks. I'm, so glad to. Yeah, that. thanks. That's wonderful. I'm in need of a water bottle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you to everybody. And um, I'm going to stop recording now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It wasn't intimate. It was intimate. <laughs> and there were no sounds. <laughs>